Good morning, everyone. Is it a good morning? Excellent. So, good morning, ladies, and uh, of course, I can see a few gentlemen also in the audience. Uh, good to have this conversation over a cup of coffee, you know. That, that is what I have loved all my... <laughs> coffee will come here as well. You are waiting for coffee or conversation also? Okay, excellent, excellent. So, uh, you know something, uh, you, many of you know me, of course, I'm Jagdish Patankar. Uh, you're working very closely with uh, all the women associations, women groups. Uh, you know, I, I try to live three dreams in my life. And all three remain, in a way, unfulfilled. Okay? So, uh, you know, when I was in college in Pune, uh, there was a cafe near my college by the name Cafe Delight. And uh, whole day I would sit there. It was a, it was a joint for leftists. Uh, so you can imagine. So much of conversation and discussion. And there was one waiter by the name Chandru, and he used to do this meter coffee, you know, this typical South Indian meter coffee. And first time when I tasted it, I said, I mean, what is this drink? Because we used to make coffee at home the way tea would be made, and it was, I mean, horrible. So, so this was like an amrit to me when I drank that. And then first inspiration I got was, I must do something in coffee. Maybe I should start a coffee shop. That was my first dream. The second dream uh, I lived when I was in school, and in those days flying was not very common, but uh, my school particularly was very adventurous, so they planned a trip for the sc school children, and I was in fifth standard, and I took my first flight from Pune to Mumbai. So that was my first flight, and I was so impressed by that whole thing, that experience, that for many years I wanted to be a pilot. And later on, when I moved into actual career, I was into advertising and I dabbled into copywriting. And uh, as I started uh, doing copywriting, you know, for various brands and things, that, that, things like that, I also thought of writing a couple of books. And the, the, the basic outline of that, it's still there. I've preserved it in a book, in a, in a notebook, which is there in the cupboard. So these are the three dreams. And all the three dreams, in a way, remained unfulfilled. And here I am sitting with the two women who have actually lived that dream. So, I mean, uh, that's why I told Parul, Parul, nothing doing. I'm going to conduct this session. I'm going to converse with these two wonderful ladies. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to, you know, uh, welcome uh, here on, on stage with us, Mrs. Sunali Nimenan, uh, very much Bangalorean, number Bangalorean, you know, as uh, we can say it. Uh, uh, as many of you know, she's an awake member also. Last year, she was awarded with uh, Jewel of uh, Karnataka. And during her lifespan, uh, has won many, many awards in her career. Uh, I have worked very, very closely with her as a part of India International Coffee Festival. Uh, she is an avid coffee lover, coffee expert, coffee taster, uh, you know, runs an organization, traveled across the globe, globally known. So that's, so give a grand welcome to uh, Mrs. Menon. And uh, here is uh, another wonderful lady with us, uh, Ms. Manjit Hirani. She is a She's a pilot. I mean, for how many years you have been a pilot? 24 years. 24 years uh, and, and now a trainer. Uh, she's also the author. And that is so, she has lived two dreams of mine. You know, she has been a pilot. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, she's an author. She has uh, published two. Her second book is just uh, about to get released uh, shortly. And here we have these two uh, wonderful ladies with us. So, without, uh, you know, uh, spending any more time, because I know you are here to more listen to them than me talking to uh, uh, both, of, uh, both of them. Uh, what I would do is I would open the conversation with uh, uh, both of you, starting with uh, Mrs. Menon, as to, uh, I mean, I would really like to understand from you as to what really in those days, I mean, my mom was also a school teacher, right? But not many women uh, were into careers, wanted to do anything. And uh, as early as I think in 60s and 70s, you must have moved into, you know, doing... Yeah. So, can you uh, tell, tell us about what, what is it that inspired you to get into, uh, you know, coffee and whatever that you are doing, or you did at that time? This is probably a little story behind how I got into the coffee profession. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in Chennai, and being a very traditional home, I grew up in a very, very traditional home. The day started with my grandmother making her cup of coffee. You know, every week she would go down the street, buy the roasted coffee beans, bring them home, grind them on a small home grinder, 
and make the coffee on our very heritage, traditional Indian daba filter, as I call it. Even today, I use it. So it used to be brewed. The whole house used to be just filled with the aroma of coffee, you know, beautiful smell. And I still remember, we used to literally plead with her to give us a few drops of coffee. Because, you know, coffee was, even today, I find that most homes, we bar children from drinking coffee. We say they need milk because they are growing up. So, well, that philosophy still remains. And I would plead with her saying, please do give me a few drops. And she would say, behave yourself today, study well, and you can have your few drops of coffee. So then I would take my milk, sit on the, at the dining table, and feel so grown up drinking that milk. So those were the first nostalgic moments about coffee. I grew up with coffee. And during the holidays, we would be taken to the tea estates because my mother's brother was a, uh, a tea uh, manager, a manager of those. In those days, it was called Finlay's. It was run by the British. So we would go there. There was no electricity. There was, you know, good food to eat, big gardens to roam around. We could just walk where we please with no honking of horns or saying, be careful when you're crossing the road. We, never ha we were never admonished. And I still remember going to the tea factory and, uh, you know, watching this uh, tea being kept in little bowls, white crucibles, as I would call them. And you might see my uncle taking a spoonful of it, making a loud slurp, and then spitting it out and saying, ah, this is excellent. Or he would call the tea maker and fire him. So, I, I mean, I used to think, what a fascinating job to be in. Take a spoonful, you make a loud slurp. My mother used to admonish me when I used to drink milk with a loud slurp. We used to love to have little milk moustaches. So I thought this was fascinating. And after they finished their tasting, as later on we realized that it was tasting, uh, me and my sister would have a spitting competition. We take a spoonful, make a loud slurp, and see who spat the farthest. Those were the memories that get locked into my memory bank. And when I finished my college, I'm a food technologist, I decided I'll be a dietitian. When I saw an ad in the papers in Bangalore, my father was working here, so I came in here. And the ad said, calling for a coffee taster. Uh -huh. Now, it brought back memories of the spitting competition. <laughs> so I applied for this, and I found I was the only woman. Everyone around me were men. All were doctorates. I was just a master's. I said, I'm not going to get this job. Who's going to give a woman? And I almost lost it, but fortunately for me, stood first in the written test and in the interview. And I fortunately had a chairman who's from Karnataka State, the IAS officer, Dr. Hedgie, the late Dr. Hedgie be ready. He said, you cannot bias, you cannot, you know, dismiss a person just because she's a woman. She stopped everything. Give her an opportunity. Culture may say that she will get married and leave. And all the training that we give, you know, a lot of training goes into this profession, would go awry, would go to waste. But give her an opportunity. I have never looked back after that. I've been in coffee for many, many, many years, and I thoroughly enjoy my profession. Wow. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. And it, it's nice to also hear, being a man, there was some, someone at that time who recognized I cannot do without you men. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Manjit, uh, that brings me to uh, uh, the career that you chose uh, to be a pilot. I mean, um, I don't know, maybe you, were, you must be one of the very first pilots in, in those days, right? And I mean, how did you ever uh, think of that, imagine that, and actually did it? That must be very, very exciting. We are all excited to know about it. Yes, I think it should be on. Just try. Hello, Vidya. Hi, everyone. Um, I have to say one thing, it was never my dream to be a pilot. And I didn't even know that ladies could fly. My father was in the army, so we used to get posted to various places. And I used to see a lot of guys uh, in the Air Force, Hinden or somewhere. And it was my dream to marry a pilot. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so in true way, my dream has not come <laughs> fulfilled. <laughs> But I joined Indian Airlines in 1986 as an air hostess. Oh. And uh, I worked for two years. So when I was an air hostess, that time I realized I saw a lady pilot, Captain Sodamini Deshmukh. I'm sure yes. everybody has. She's the, the first pilot? Actually, she's not the first in India. She's the second one. I see. First was Dorba Banerjee. Uh -huh. But she's a lady who got her command first, who, who really made it. Okay. And uh, everybody knows about her. Yeah. So, I still remember I was flying to her 
from Bombay to Calcutta. I was the hostess that day and she came with me as a passenger and somebody told me she's a pilot. So I said, wow, women can fly. Like that was the first experience. And though still I would say I didn't have a dream to be a pilot. And, but after six, eight months, I realized my job that, okay, fine, I have to do something more challenging. And those days, uh, there used to be a serial called Uran. If you all have seen it, it used to come on Doordarshan about uh, Kavita Chaudhary struggling to be an IPS officer. So, you know, I used to be very fascinated with the serial. And I used to think that, you know, I should do something more challenging. Somehow I wanted challenge, you know, that uh, in the men's world that you can't do and, you know, you have to struggle and get it. So I decided to be a pilot. Trust me, an overnight decision. And my brother, who's your friend, Mahendra Singh, I had like not even discussed this from my home, you know, that I want to be a pilot. I just went to my friend's house. She gave me a form to fill. She said, you know, uh, we have to give an exam, RT, that is radio and telephony. And we need a gazetted officer's signature on the form. So I came home, gave it to my brother. I said, I need a signature of gazetted officer. He didn't even ask me a single question. He said, okay, I'll get it for you. So I got the, I filled up the form, studied for it, and I cleared the exam. Actually, there were four exams to be cleared. I cleared all three. Then I told my mother, and you know, my father uh, died very young. He died of cancer in 1978. So we were living on his pension, and there was not much money. All three of us were working and studying together. So those days, I spent four lakhs, which was a big sum. So how the money will come up, there was no, we were clueless. But because I kept giving the exams, and trust me, everything kept falling in the place. Like somebody gave me a, a loan of 1,10,000. There was a Sikh gentleman who gave me 50,000 rupees donation. I'd gone to his house a uh, couple of times. And last time I went to his house to tell him that, fine, it's okay, I can't raise the money, it's okay. But he went and his wife came with 50,000 rupees cash, and she gave it to me. So things just worked. And I went to USA to do my flying. Excellent. So, in a way, uh, you know what I uh, understand from uh, both of you that uh, in those days, and things have changed, but not yet dramatically. And I think there is a lesson for all the all the young uh, women today that uh, hurdles are bound to be there, right? I mean, you faced a situation where you thought that you would never make it. You faced a situation of financial challenges and how to raise money and all that, but you were persistent with it and you know, things started happening. So I think that is one important lesson I would uh, say that, uh, that comes out, that uh, uh, the path for the ladies, you know, in this male-dominated world is not easy. Uh, there are opportunities, but one has to be persistent, one has to be committed, and one has to keep trying, and then only probably you will be able to in a way, achieve or fulfill your dream. So, coming back to this uh, challenges or this male-dominated uh, world, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Menon, uh, what are those challenges, you know, in this male-dominated world? Something at the, at the core of your heart you think, uh, many things get spoken and many things remain unspoken. You know, what would you like to really say about it? Uh, make your observation, and you can be absolutely candid, you know. Uh, I've been working with women's group and, you know, there's a Ubuntu group, by the way, on, on our uh, WhatsApp group, which is of all ladies, and there are only two gentlemen in that group. I'm one of them, so now... You can <laughs> 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 <You also included. laughs> yeah. I think, uh, you know, basically what I've, I found in my career was coffee is entirely male-dominated. I think all of us are very familiar with that. And I still remember when I used to walk into a room, you know, where there's a meeting on, I would perhaps be the only woman entering it. And people, you know, conversations would stop immediately seeing me walk in, wondering, this is not the room you, you should enter, this is the wrong room you've entered. And then one, I still remember another incident where a gentleman said, can I have a cup of coffee, please? So I said, sure, you'd be served a cup of coffee, but let me first say what I have to say, I've come for this meeting. So what I find is that there are very, very many challenges. There are challenges, perhaps in every profession there is a challenge, more, uh, probably more so in some of these very male-dominated professions. But I think what I gathered over the years that I've been in is that if you know your subject, if you gather knowledge base on the subject, you one up and one up above the pe people with whom you interact with, I think you can walk with confidence. You can walk into the room 
And today when I walk into the room, I don't find anyone stopping the conversation. In fact, maybe they'll stop the conversation because they want to ask me a question saying, what opinion do you have on the subject? So there are challenges, but I think you can overcome this when you get the knowledge on the subject, when you are confident with yourself. And I always find that you have to put across your, your knowledge base or your opinion very, very subtly, very gently to get it across so that they hear your voice. And of course, once they know that you know what you're talking, I think the doors open, uh, you know, the carpets are thrown out, people welcome you into their gatherings, and you're no longer considered as a person of an opposite gender. So, so, so in a way, it is, yeah, indeed, yes, and, and almost all women here, you know, they're all women of worth, as, you know, Wow says, and they've all, I'm sure, gone through such uh, similar uh, situations. Manjit, how about, uh, what is your, because uh, you know, your field, in a way, was a very, very difficult field, uh, and probably you were one of the first 10 pilots, if I may guess. Yeah. So, uh, what would you like to say? Um, yes, when I joined, uh, that was in 89, uh, as a pilot. So, we were very few. I think just two, three in Bombay, and overall, as you're saying, less than 10. So, what I really knew was, ki when I used to fly, uh, any mistake you have made in the cockpit, Trust me, everybody knew. Once, I don't know, I can't remember what I had done wrong, but at least five guys came and asked me that, Manjeet, this is what you did wrong today. Oh. So like, because it was, you were like an item piece for them, you know, like a lady coming and flying with you. So you were talked about every single thing. So as she's saying, you had to be good in your job, extremely. And... Uh, that, of course, goes without saying that you have to be, and you had to be one edge above the guys. Because if you made a mistake, everybody will talk about it. Yeah, it will get amplified. Yeah. Yeah. And the drawback with women, I'm not saying is there anything wrong, but what happens is uh, there's a man to man bonding. You know, they will meet over a drink, they will meet over a, a, this thing, a, a place of squash, or, you know, a game of squash or something, which we women can't do. So they're Tie-ups are very strong. And when you're, the training, things are easy, settings are done, but we can't do that. If you do that, you're labeled. Okay, she's talking to that guy too much, something is on between them. So you had to be careful about those things also, because you want to definitely uh, uh, secure your image also, you know, your image conscious also. And also, this is, I hope it's not recorded and all, it's off no. the other thing. Okay. No, no. Once I'd gone uh, for a flight from Bombay to Delhi, and I was operate, supposed to operate a flight Delhi to Kathmandu. Okay. Bombay to Delhi, I went as a passenger. And I was to do a flight Delhi to Kathmandu. Uh, but the commander, senior commander, when he saw me, he's saying, no, I'm not going to fly with a woman. So I was bumped off the flight. Like wow. I had gone, <laughs> so I was sent back to the hotel. <laughs> so, so he actually refused flying with you? Yeah, he refused flying with me. So we have faced all those things. But of course, to me, it was okay, fine. I'll go to Delhi Hotel. Taj, we used to stay and have a nice buffet. That time, we were not health conscious and we used to eat everything in the buffet. <laughs> so, but I'm just saying, yes, these were the challenges. And now, fortunately, there are many girls. So now, it doesn't matter. All we hear is, okay, who's a co-pilot? Who's a, this thing? It doesn't matter whether it's a girl or a boy. It's, what we want to know is how much experience they have, how many hours we have. Because now that I'm a trainer, so I fly with brand new co-pilots. For me, the only thing I want to know how many hours you have, how much experience you have. It doesn't matter whether you're a girl or boy. Okay. So in a way, I would say uh, two things I have noted from uh, what you mentioned just now, that one of the biggest challenges that women do face, and I'm sure even today that the problem persists, is even a small mistake gets amplified. You know, a small mistake gets amplified, and which means you're always put on test. It's like you're always on test. You have to Keep proving yourself. You know, uh, I would like to share with you an experience of mine when I was flying. A, a very senior gentleman uh, sitting next to me, uh, must be a, uh, you know, from the top management of uh, one of the uh, best organizations. And we had a wonderful conversation. I was flying to Delhi. And uh, the flight was just about to land. I mean, few minutes before that, for some reason, it didn't land. And, uh, you know, yeah, it got prolonged and it flew over. Uh, uh, the, the airport and then it started taking life. What he says, you know, to me, and I still remember those words. 
मुझे पता था ये लेडी पायलट है ना कुछ तो पंखा होगा कैन यू बिलीव दिस आई मीन आई वॉज टर्न यू नो आफ्टर हियरिंग दैट कॉमेंट आई एंड आई टोल्ड इम दैट लुक जेंटलमैन आई नो यू नो आई हैव कम अक्रॉस एस्ट्रोन एट हुज अमेन एट दैट टाइम सुनीता विलियम्स वॉज एंड आई हैड डन वन इवेंट विथ हर आई सर वॉट यू टॉकिंग अबाउट देर आर एस्ट्रोन एट्स वर वीमेन एंड हियर यू आर डाउटिंग दी केपेबिलिटी ऑफ अ वूमेन हुज अ पायलट I mean, this was as as uh, you know, just just about a decade ago. This is the kind of so that is one. So the problem is great amplified, and the only way probably uh, is to deal with it is, is you better be good. Good means very good. So in a way, there is a message to all of us here, uh, women, that uh, you know, the world is still testing us, and but we have to look at it positively. And this challenge is going to make us even better. So we have to work hard to prove ourselves even better than the colleagues and the men. so that you know our dream of uh, equality and equal world where men and women are shoulder to shoulder in every respect we we realize soon so i think those two wonderful insights uh, that uh, both of you have given so moving forward so this is about the early days uh, uh, now you have been in this profession you been there done that you were with coffee board right for many years you were heading the research over there uh, what really insp inspired you to get out of that job and get into something which was a untested you know waters in a way because i am not heard of any coffee lab the kind of lab that you run if some of the images are there you can put those images here on the screen uh, so can you can you share that uh, with us actually it was a a quirk of fate yeah. uh, i worked in the coffee board for 20 years and the market got liberalized for coffee in 1996 95 september and i took the voluntary retirement saying i've had enough of working my husband was working in an overseas country my daughter was with me we decided enough is enough we'll go and join papa we won't be here in india anymore let's go and join him so i resigned from the board took my voluntary retirement and decided to go back to where my husband was working but then i think that's why i say it is a male dominated profession but when you develop the confidence in in the the male farmers or the the very few women farmers it's mainly men and even if i own a farm it will be my husband who will run the farm that's the that's the heritage in our country so i decided that i would leave when the farmers came to me and said you can't leave us in the lurch right now we need your help you've been in quality for many years you've taught us many things about how to improve but we don't know how to market coffee with quality how do we link the two so you cannot just leave us so that's when i thought about it and i said i can come provided you allow me to be with my family at least 15 days in a month that's how the journey started i set up the lab the farmers helped me and though i decided i will spend only 15 days at home it became 20 days it became 25 days then it became once in two months I mean coffee is something which is so so you know it's so stimulating so energizing and it just draws you to it and it draws you especially when you find that you have the trust and faith of the farmers they put their whole livelihood into my hands and that's when i realized oh my god i really must do my job really well they trust me so implicitly they've given me their entire produce they want me to market it for them they want me to develop brands for them and it's you know that's how i started coffee la started it in as a very small venture thinking to myself i probably will be in the red every day well i was in the red for a very long time i always i still remember renuka my colleague who worked with me is here with me this would be a big joke every saturday we would say you hold the green hat i'll hold the red hat and we'll sit outside the lab hoping that people will come and give us their coffee produce that's how we started the journey but today i would say it's not that i've reached the end of the tunnel or that i've become a millionaire but what i think i've really gained from this experience is that a woman when she makes up her mind she learns her subject there will be challenges to challenge your mind there will be challenges to strengthen your hands but i think if you have a dream you have dedication you have determination and you have diligence require knowledge and most importantly be humble i think you can achieve whatever you set yourself for fantastic but but tell us little more about this coffee lab i mean uh, 
you know, we are curious to know what exactly happens there. I mean, people walk in with their beans and ask yeah. you to do something about it. Yeah. How do, do corporate come to you? Internet? I see you connected globally. I mean, how that has happened? Yes, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Coffee Lab. You always wonder, how can, a, how can there be a lab for coffee? In fact, I was just telling uh, Manjit uh, a few minutes ago, I was going to, down the road for a walk last evening. I take off 20 minutes off from work every evening because I need to walk, I need to get my you know, senses cleared up, and I need to give my palate a rest. So I walked down the road, and I met this lady, and she said, what do you do? I said, I work in coffee. I have a lab. She said, what's this lab? How can you have a lab for coffee? And then, when I said I'm a taster, she was even more flawed. She said, oh, you drink coffee the whole day? And you get paid also for it? What a lovely job. I'd love to join you. So let me just dispel some of those little myths that one has about a lab for coffee, what I do as a taster. What we do is we receive coffees from different regions across the India, across the globe. I get coffees from around the world. And what we do is when the coffee bean comes in, we have a certain protocol that we need to follow for roasting it, for grinding it, for preparing the brew. But then you need to have the equity of taste. And fortunately, I think both of us have the equity of taste, my colleague and myself, we have the equity of taste, we're able to make out small nuances. I'm sure there are many in this room who have a fabulous equity of taste. It's just that, you know, you say, oh, too much salt in my food today. Oh, I can get a funny smell today in the kitchen. I'm sure all of us have gone through those. And some of us have got that very keen perception of sense of smell. So we develop that. So in my lab, we taste these coffees, we identify the uniqueness of these coffees, the negatives in the coffees, then we also have to give them the reasons or the causative factors for these negatives and the positives. And we guide the farmer as to how when he plucks the cherry, coffee incidentally is a fruit, we only consume the seed within the fruit, how the cherries must be plucked, how they should, the pulp material must be removed, how to process the beans, how to dry the coffee beans. And there are so many steps where quality can be adversely affected. So we give them the reasons, and when they confirm it, it's great excitement in the lab. So that's one aspect of testing the quality, how to improve it, how to develop a brand for coffee. You don't be surprised, but green beans can be sold in the market as a branded product. It's not manufactured, it's natural, it's nature's own beans. How do I present it in the world market? That's where the challenge comes in. It's a uniqueness in the beans. You'd be surprised, but coffee has a citrus note. It is orange, it is lemon. We always think of coffee, when you ask someone, I'm sure in this group, if I ask someone, I mean, what is the taste that you get? You probably will say, it's very strong. It's got a nice chocolate caramel note, or it's very bitter. There's so much beyond that. There's so much of character there. So we identify those characteristic notes and develop the brand. We have brands like Taste of Freedom. We have Veera Khan. We have Buttercup Bowl, Temple Mountain. These are well-established brands, and the buyer comes back repeatedly every year to buy these beans. That's one aspect. Second aspect is we certify coffees for many buyers around the world. We have Illy Cafe, which we do completely. It's an international brand. We do the entire certification for Indian coffee from, that goes from here. We also do a lot of blending for the cafes. We have Costas. We've done a blend for them. We've done for Cafe Coffee Day. We do all their blends. We also do a blend for Flying Squirrel. We have done blends for Dunkin' Donuts. So we do blends across the globe. We do it even overseas clients. We have lots of blends that we make. We train people. If any of you would love to you know, dabble and appreciate coffee and see whether you have a great palate, I, I, I sort of encourage you to come to some of those one-day courses that we hold where you can appreciate the nuances in the cup and go beyond just saying the coffee is strong or the coffee is weak or the coffee is bitter. I think that's the major part of work that we do. We also work with the machine manufacturers, checking the quality of their equipment, I do, I do training across the globe, I go overseas, I train farmers in different parts of the world. I also teach, I teach at the University of Udine in Italy, I do the master's course for them. So it's, it's just not just putting a spoon into your mouth, rolling it and spitting it, looking wise, but there's a lot of science behind the whole. Wow.
so inspirational and unbelievable. And, and I, I have been working with her. I've been so fortunate to work with her on you know, the coffee festival that we put together and the workshops that you conduct and how it just draws audience from across India, across globe. It's absolutely unbelievable, really. Uh, you know, coming back to this inspiration aspect, you know, you have to draw inspiration from what you do and probably that takes you to the higher level, next level. And I think something like that happened with you, Manjit. I mean, you were a pilot for 25 years and is it something that when you sit in that cockpit and look around and something happens, starts happening, I mean, what really made you, uh, while continuing with your profession, get into writing? And tell us about your, your I think you wrote a first book, uh, a family kind of a book, and now uh, there is another book that you are writing. So we are very curious to know about it. I'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think what happens is, um, you know, it's also in your belief system. Like I've seen a lot of pilots who, or whatever professions they do, they do that profession and they retire with that profession. With me, I think I have this thing, though I've understood these things now, but the patterns have been same since childhood. Like, I believe in being a constant seeker. For me, I do one thing, like, um, I'll give you a little background of my family. I come from an extremely traditional family. And uh, I was engaged. Believe me, I was engaged when I was born. And uh, to me, I had no goal, no ambition in my life. When I was in ninth standard, before my father died, he got me officially engaged because it was a childhood thing. And to me, it was only you have to get married. That's it. So when I was, uh, I came in 11th standard, I was 16 years old. I was in college. I, this guy came to meet me for the first time in college. And I just told him one thing that, you know, I don't want to marry you and I can't marry you. Because to me, it was the world. You know, I didn't want to just get married and close myself like my other cousins and my relatives had done. That's what I'm saying, the patterns, now I understand. But now that I've done some uh, these psychometric tests and all for my uh, this thing, so I've understood that these things have not come now. These are my patterns right from childhood. So first thing I broke the engagement, and first thing what I did was I told my mother I want to be a graduate, and because in our uh, how, household the girls would be tenth or twelfth, max twelfth, and get married. So I was the first graduate from the family. Then the next step I wanted to do was I wanted to work, so I worked with a shoe company. Then I realized, no, I have to do something more. I became an air hostess. From hostess, I became a pilot. So when a pilot, then of course, the things in your own profession, you want to upgrade yourself. So I became a commander. Then I became a trainer. So for me, the thing was always there, constant seeker. Good. Because I feel this is not enough. You, like, okay, okay, you put a couple of years to do one particular thing. Then you're done with that, you know. You've mastered it. Then the next step. Now I'm a trainer, I've mastered that act. So I started writing blogs because I also, uh, I write blogs on manjeethirani.com if you go through. You know, I have a lot of quest of life. Like I will go and do a past life regression. I'll question things like about, you know, today what I am, it, was it my destiny? Was it I destined for this or did I make my destiny? So always my mind overworks, you know, about faith of God, about this, about that. So I keep writing that about my blogs. So this dog which came to a house, my husband is, um, Rajkumar Hirani, who's made uh, Three Idiots and PK, Munna Bhai and BBS, the series. So he made a film, PK. And in that film, there was a dog, if you all have seen the film, in Anushka Sharma's hand, little baby. So I was very scared of, petrified of dogs, right from childhood. And my son always wanted a dog, but never came to the house because of my fear. So when the dog, after the shoot, was supposed to go back to the breeder, my husband decided to send it home. So he actually gift wrapped it <laughs> in a basket, put ribbons and all that, and he sent it to the house. Oh. So Buddy is the name of the dog. In the film, he was Niku. So he was only six weeks old, though I was very scared of dogs. But when he came to the house, and I mean, there's an introduction that my son has written about it. So I welcomed the dog. To me, it was like, I would say motherhood revisited. So because that, how do I say? The philosophy was there. It, it's all the time in me, you know. I philosophize everything. I philosophize food also. If you uh, take me to your coffee plantations, I'll philosophize that also. <laughs> <laughs> so I started capturing uh, this thing about Buddy, you know. Uh, the first time I... See, Veer, my son, he was 14 when we got the dog. 
he said, you know, I'll do everything. But, you know, we all know that the children just play and he used to sleep with me, that's it. So I had to take the charge, take him to the vet, you know, see what food he eats. Then after immunizations, I thought I'll take him for a walk. And I took him for a walk. And that's the first time I've taken a dog for a walk. So I, had, I was clueless. I took him very close to my house. You won't believe it that day. Four, five or maybe more, uh, the stray dogs came after chasing after us. And I got so scared, I started crying. And there were some women, you know, they had some hay on their heads. I told them, please, please, aap log mujhe ghair lo. And I stood inside them and I said, please shoo away the dog. So they did that. And I told one guy, he was traveling, I said, please drop me to the house. So he came and he escorted me to the house. So I mentioned this incident to a friend of mine who stays in the area. So she's saying, Are you know, do one thing, don't go there, you go near the school, there are no stray dogs there. There's a uh, uh, school uh, close to my house. So next day I took the dog over there. When I took him to the school, till the street there were no dogs. But when I crossed the road, again the stray dogs came behind us. I quickly crossed the road. But when I crossed the road, those guys didn't come behind me. So that is the first blog I wrote. It's still there on my website. I said, dogs are very territorial. They have their own territory. And each one has it. So I said, but then, because I'm very fond of reading um, all kinds of books. I said, but so are, you know, the tigers are territorial. The apes are territorial. The fish is territorial. But I said, so are we human beings. We human beings also fight over territories, about religion, about caste, about Kaveri River, which I find it very funny, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu fighting over it. It's water of the nature and two states fighting over Kaveri River issue. So I said, but so are we at home also. We have our favorite chair in the kitchen, Saas Bahu Ka Jhagda Hota Hai of the domain. So we are territorial as human beings. So that I felt came, comes from the nature. So why do we blame? It's inheritance. But I said, we human beings are above these, uh, we have a consciousness. We can rise above these things. So this I wrote, then I wrote about puberty. When my dog was two years old, he was all over on the sofa, on the table. I said, this is nature, we're accepting it. And my son was 14. I said, when he's also still hitting at puberty, or if somebody has a daughter there, so the parents become like watch cards. I said, why are we so this thing? It's nature, we don't live life as per nature. So this is how I made my observations. And I wrote, um, Three I posted on my blog. I wrote 10 of them in my iPad and I thought I'll post one every week, like make life easy for myself. But then <laughs> that constant, uh, this thing in me, you know. I was at Delhi airport once and there's a big uh, bookshop called WH Smith. I was, you know, we, have, we get ground time over there. I had some two hours there. I go to the shop, tell a salesman. I said, you know, I've written a book. He says, yes, very good, madam. And I said, it's about my dog. <laughs> I have only 10 of those chapters. Yeah. And I said, can you give me some names of publishers? So he was very sweet, Rajmal Sharma. He gave me three names. One was Rupa, one was Harper Collins, one was Penguin. Anyway, I'll tell you the Penguin story. I called the Penguin and I said, I've written a book. He said, really? Okay. Can you give us 50,000 words? I said, I don't understand words, but I have some chapters I called it. I have 10 chapters with me. So, uh, she was actually being very reluctant about it. I said, okay, I'll do one thing. I'll send you the link of my blog on the WhatsApp. If you like it, you see. If you don't like it, I'm fine with it. So next day, uh, the same day, in fact, I will not even wait for the next day. I quickly sent her the link of my blog. Next day, I get a call for her around 10, 30, 11. She's saying, ah, we like uh, the concept. Because it's a new concept, you know, because it's all philosophy. She said, can you give us uh, 25,000 words? So again, I told her, please don't talk about words. I've never counted how many words I write. I just write how much I feel like writing. So she said, okay, give me 20 chapters. So I had 10 with me. I wrote another 10, honestly, in 20 days. <laughs> <laughs> and I submitted everything. And then they came back with a contract. And then there was a little gap, you know. I thought, abhi nahi hoga, you know. But one fine day, I get an email. Ki, let's start working on edit. So that was wow. something euphoric and it happened and here it is. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Lovely. So in a way, uh, uh, you actually lived your dream in the sense everything that you looked at it 
philosophically, you talk to the publisher, you actually send. So many times I feel that we, what we all do is we think of doing many things and we just leave it halfway through. We just don't pursue it. And when we pursue with something, yeah. Okay. I'll just add, uh, just to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I feel I have simple three mantras in life. First one is to be a constant seeker. And to be a constant seeker, one has to take action. Job bol rahe, okay? Yes. Because, theek hai, aapko lagta hai ki iske baad ye karna hai, wo karna hai. But you have to take action, otherwise it will be just left in your heart and in your mind only. And the third is, for me, I'm an explorer. I think you have to explore in life. There's so much to offer. There's, life is just beyond your work, your family, yourself. There's much more to that. Excellent. So, two lessons I have learned from this con little conversation of inspiration. One thing is, now that my second phase of life would begin probably at some point of time, I'll come back to you. As I re rather than retiring, I would like to retire with a maybe a cafe. Uh, uh, yeah, with Chandru there, you know, designer cafe. As may, and will take inputs from you. And those two books which are, you know, in, in, the, in my notebook, just kept preserved. Maybe I'll take that out and look at how I can take this further. Excellent. Thank you so much for these two insights. Uh, moving further, as you know, this entire gathering is about, uh, you know, women of worth. Many of them are entrepreneurs, right? So, what kind of opportunity? I mean, the coffee world has just opened up, isn't it? I mean, I am working with you and I am so fascinated by what is happening in this sector. Why don't you share with others as to what opportunities you see and I am sure at the end of the session if there are 10 you know, entrepreneurs emerging out of this conversation, I, it would be wonderful. I think when you look at women per se, I think all of us in this room will agree that whenever we take on any assignment, we are very conscientious, we are very careful, our attention to detail is more than 100% and we study the, uh, the, uh, the profession very carefully. And uh, most importantly, I notice, at least we have seen in our own company, that when I give a task to a woman, when I, give, when I ask her to complete a particular item of work, even if it goes beyond time, she'll never put it off for the morrow. It's always completed. And I think what I would like to perhaps put across to the women here is, I think it would be a great idea for us to set up a small roastery. You can form a small self-help group, set up little roasteries, and set up a small roaster. Today, you know, especially not only in the south, people in the north, in the east, in the west of India, everyone drinks coffee. Coffee is considered, as she was just saying, it's a style statement today. So I think we can pursue this style statement. I think we as women can get together, set up a little roastery, roast coffee, sell it in small packages. That could be one option. The second option today is, if you look at all the cafes, now we need the barista. Now, the barista is not just a coffee maker. I still remember when cafes first opened their doors here in India, when I would talk about the barista, oh, that coffee cook, is it? He cooks, he makes coffee, what is it? You know, it's something like Chandru, but Chandru is actually an honor job. Yes. But people don't understand that. But today, people look at a barista with great respect, not just a coffee maker. He's actually, she or he is the link between the coffee machine and the coffee consumer, a very vital link to serve an excellent cup of coffee. So today you have, you know, courses, you can become a barista. And we want barista in the cafes. Cafes have come up, you know, I think there are more than 3,100 cafes in India today. So that's another beautiful profession. I mean, it doesn't matter, age is no bar at all over here. In fact, I feel, you know, when I walk into the cafe, I'm a, I have a lot of gray hair on my head. People look at me saying, huh, you're coming into the cafe. But today, people look at me, okay, she's also coming into the cafe. Good, good fun, let's join in the fun. <laughs> so you can be a barista too. You can also perhaps, you know, work, uh, I, in fact, there is a cafe, you can open up your own cafe. Today there is a cafe which is run by a woman called Coffee Mechanics. She and her husband and another partner have set up a cafe. So you can set up a small little cafe, you can have book reading, you can, you know, sell all the food that you make. I know all of us are excellent cooks. I mean, you, I was just walking around, you have some delicious, uh, you know, food items that you can serve along with your coffee. Today it's coffee pairing. It's not just drinking, you know, a cup of coffee. It's a cup of coffee. I always say coffee is a harbinger of memories, of conversation, a lot of laughter. So I think we can generate that through just taking on this coffee bean. A tiny bean, it's a bean of wisdom, let me tell you. It's so creative, it's so complex, and it's beautiful to be in this profession. 
So those of you who would like to, you know, get into the coffee business, please come over to my lab. It's more like a museum because I believe that when you work, you need to have aesthetics around you. You need to be happy. You need to remember those various little places that you went to or the little anecdotes that you had in your life. I think I have all those little, you know, anecdotes in those little mugs, in those coffee roasters, in those little packets of coffee and in the mugs of coffee. So I think you could come to my lab, probably see what we do, smell the coffee, go through an appreciation course, and set up your own little cafe or your own little darshini. I mean, today filter coffee is still very popular in our country. Have a tiny little darshini, serve a nice cup of coffee with maybe some pakodis to go with it. I always love pakodis. So you can serve it with the pakodis and probably, you know, be, get that satisfaction from that tiny bean. Excellent. And Manjit, how about uh, you? What kind of, uh, you know, opportunities you see in your field maybe going forward to the ladies here? You would like to share some ideas about uh, what is possible? Yes, of course. I feel, um, see, of course, in aviation, one thing is to do professional flying. But also there are things like one can do just hobby flying. It's because, if, because whenever I meet some people, like you're saying, it is my dream to be a pilot. Yeah. I say, you can do it now. You can just do a PPL course, private pilot's license. You just need 40 hours. Age is no bar? Age is no bar. I'm good. Yes. Oh, serious? Yes. Because I feel, why not? I mean, you can be in your profession. Because see, I did my flying from USA. And over there, the flying club, which we used to do uh, flying, uh, there were many people who were just PPL holders. You need that basic initial license. Yeah. They would hire a plane and take it over a weekend and uh, go for a weekend outing. But we, India, we don't do this. There is hand gliding, there is paragliding, and all that is done in Panchmani. In fact, I had gone to Switzerland for a holiday, uh, that great uh, interlaken where Yash Chopra always shoots. Yeah. So I did paragliding there, and that lady, she told me that in winters, that's the time in summers she does over there. In fact, I have a number also, Australian instructor. In summers, she comes to Panchmani, and she teaches paragliding. Oh. One can also do as a vocation, you know, or as I said, PPL, and now things are coming up, these things, you know, you can just hire a plane and say, take a flight from Pune to Goa, spend your weekend in Goa and fly down and come back. <laughs> so there are, I always feel, even if you're 60, if you had a dream to be a pilot, you can do it if, in India, or you can go abroad and do a course, it just takes a month. So one can, one should fulfill your dreams and desires if we had anything, you know. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a lovely and there's conversation. there's one in Kamshet also. One in Kamshet also. Yes. There are so many places around my city. I think I can retire happily, start a cafe, you know, have a book publishing, conversation. Fly. Yeah, fly, super, and keep coming back to Bangalore also, because that is another lovely place for me. Great. <laughs> and before we conclude, and I know the next uh, panelists are here, and I think the next session is also on food, right? Oh, so much of aroma is already spreading into the room. Uh, uh, some of the ladies may would like to ask maybe a couple of questions we can take and then move on to the next session. So are there any, any questions anybody would like to ask? Just, just raise your hand and uh, we can take. Just, just take the mic. Just take the mic. Yes, my lab is in Bangalore. The courses are held in Bangalore at my lab, which is in Sadashiv Nagar. So we give you the address if you still feel like you can just come and see and smell the coffee in my lab. Probably she needs the contact details, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this coffee was really intoxicating. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here, here is another, another youngster. Uh, yeah. Hi, it was lovely to hear both of you. Uh, Sunalini, you mentioned about uh, your job that you love, but you didn't mention what you had to give up for it. So I've heard that tasters <laughs> don't eat a lot of things and don't drink and don't do a lot of, uh, you know, things that you would otherwise do. So would you like to mention that? Yes, uh, probably I'll start with saying I gave up my life for coffee. Uh, well, uh, what, uh, generally what we need, we need to preserve the palate. Of course, if I have a tea taster in the room, he probably will contest it. But I have seen over the years that I have been in coffee, I have to preserve my palate, which means I sort of modulate the spice. You know, in India, we eat a lot of spicy food. So I keep off the spicy food. 
Of course, alcohol, that's another mm -hmm. thing that we keep off, because an occasional glass of wine is not going to affect the palate. But the hard liquor, yes, we keep off hard liquor. Smoking, yes. And of course, when I'm coming into tasting, I have to have a good night's rest. Otherwise, I probably will uh, see double into my coffee cup. So it's very important that I keep good health. And the most important thing is to ensure that I am able to carry on this organoleptic <laughs> testing that I carry out, which because it's very subjective when I speak, becomes very objective through the years of training and experience that we have, preserving health, preserving the mind. I think uh, it's uh, very important that we calibrate ourselves. We go through a lot of tests. In fact, every three years, I go through a test to see whether I'm on par with others in the industry who are considered brilliant in their cupping knowledge. So these are the things that we need to keep in mind when I cup coffee. Otherwise, people, I still remember when I joined the board, people would say, oh, today she's in a bad mood, she's given me poor marks. Today she's in a good mood, you know, she gave me pluses for my coffee. So to make it very objective, you need to preserve your health, preserve your state of mind, and you need to go with very positive attitude. And of course, you have to learn. I keep learning every day. And I keep training every year. So I can never say I know it all. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, will, I will conclude this with the last question to you, Manji. She talked about giving up, resisting, and all that. I have, this question I have for you. And I am curious about it. That how have you been able to resist all the glamour world around you because of Rajkumar, such a celebrated director. You could have chosen to be, a, you know, a glamorous wife of a glamorous director. Instead of that, you have, you know, charted your own course, doing so much. How do you do that? <laughs> um, actually, I became a pilot uh, in 93 and I got married in 94. So I have always been a pilot and when Raju, that time, was into editing, then he started doing advertising, then he made his first film in 2001, Munna Bhai Bebeas. But when I got married to him, I, it was an arranged marriage. The only thing I told Raju's father was that I will keep my job. I will leave your son, but not my job. These were my words. <laughs> 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 and even to Raju, when he asked me, since I said it was an arranged marriage when we spoke, uh, he, the first question he asked me was, uh, do you want to ask me something? I said, no, I have to tell you things. <laughs> because those days, as I said, we were very few of us. So I gave him my whole job profile because we travel a lot. We have to travel out of, uh, for a couple of days also out of the house. So he was fine with that. And I said, if you're fine with my job, I'm fine with you. You know, for me, there were no other questions. So I would say, uh, as a person, you have to firstly take pride in what you do. If you take pride in what you do, what your husband is doing, of course you'll feel proud of him, but that will not overpower. If you're happy with your own job, your own, you're satisfied, then I think this glamour world doesn't matter. Though we are part of the film industry, but we are not. We go once in a while for a party or something, but both of us have our individual professions. And as she said, what do you give up? Um, in the timings. Because for me, if I have an early morning departure at 5.30 a.m. and there's a party previous night or an invitation, I can't take it. And uh, this also, of course, your health gets affected because when my son was born, for first five years I would do only night flights so that I would be at home during the daytime. But then I feel, now when I look back, I feel it, it was a toll on me, you know. It really took a toll on my health. Because my logic was that at least I'm at home during the daytime to monitor him. So yes, till date, I'll be honest with you, I don't like those night flights or early morning flights. So we can't just randomly, somebody will call me up, come home for dinner, let's have a wine in the evening. You can't do that because you have restrictions. But then I tell, remind myself, I love my job, I want to do it, and it's okay if I don't go for a party or something. Thank you so much. Thank you both of you for such a lovely and inspiring uh, you know, uh, conversation that we had. And uh, your book, her book is available uh, you know, in one of the booths. Penguin publishers have a booth here and her book, uh, book is there. I, I think on Monday it is getting released, right, in, in Mumbai. So once again, uh, you know, three cheers to both the lovely day. Thank you so much. Thank you.